It has sort of an underground thing to it, you know. The dropouts all skateboarded. Very much a mi like it was a minority thing, and there was really it was definitely a subculture. We just didn't do what normal people at the time did. You know, it's always been that way. You're not supposed to do it. You're not supposed to be here. I don't know if anyone would get that if they weren't really like totally involved with skateboarding. Anywhere we went at the time, it was obvious that we were not the same or we didn't really belong in the, in the mainstream. We call a sport now where years ago it wasn't a sport, it was just kind of youth culture in a sense. I, no one really can say where it started or when it started. I, I, I always thought it was in the 50s, and, and it got really popular in the mid-60s. And when I was born, I was born in 1965, Life Magazine had the Patty McGee doing the handstand. That was the, the, week, the month I was born, it was 65, and it said the craze and menace of skateboards is what the title was on the cover of Life Magazine. Uh, my name's Todd Huber, I'm 47 years old, I'm the co-owner and one of the founders of Skate Lab. The skate Lab is an indoor skateboard park and a um, skateboarding museum, as well as the official home to the Skateboarding Hall of Fame. The skateboarding started here in California, and there's different theories. A lot of people say surfers invented skateboarding when there was no surf, and they wanted to keep surfing, so they would surf on the sidewalk. But I like to say that us kids that lived in the valley invented skateboarding because we weren't able to go surfing, whether there was surf or not. If you're like 10 and you live in Simi Valley, which is a half an hour away from the beach, and you want to surf, then what's the next best thing? Get on a skateboard. We grew up skating my whole life. Um, but, you know, again, a lot of people think it was a beach thing. It started at the beach. And, and I know that it was going on all over California in the early 60s, late 50s. The, the origins of pool skating was based in surfing. Um, and around the time that skateboarding started getting developed, um, there were a group of surfers in Southern California that, that found a way to emulate wave riding through empty swimming pools. So there's empty pools everywhere because it's so hot in the summer. Um, everyone's got a pool, but if half the people weren't bothering to fill them, that's like a dream come true. And I think it was just sort of a natural progression. We looked at that pool like, whoa, that looks pretty fun. And like, we did it, my neighbors um, moved out and we drained their pool. Like we just turned on the pump and drained the pool because it, it had a for sale sign. Like we, uh, we skated that pool all summer long. But when I was a kid in the 70s, we got to skate pools, it was awesome. And right around that time, there was a big drought in California. So all these backyard swimming pools were empty because of the drought. And so um, they, they just sort of figured out how to hit the walls the way they would the waves. Um, and by the time I discovered skateboarding, they had already figured out how to get airborne. And so I was excited by that prospect right away.
It's more of a culture, I think, over in California, you know, an accepted culture. Whereas here, you were sort of, it's not normal, you know. Dublin in the 1980s was so far from the origins of skateboarding. Here's a good example. Like this would be the front of the roller skate, and this is the back, and they flattened this, but this was like a heel cup. See, you know, see what I'm talking about? It had a piece of leather that went through it. And I have the skates, actually. They, they flattened that heel cup, and then this guy, he, he named his. He called it the Tiki 2. So like, I bet his sister or whatever had the Tiki 1. Like some dad might have made this for his two kids for Christmas. And they broke their arm, and the mom's like, what are you doing? That's so dangerous. And then they threw it in the, the closet, and then I bought it like 40 years later. Again, this is a roller skate cut in half. You can see the jagged cut. It's, you know what I mean? It's not like it was machined down. Some dude just cut it. His name started with a G. A lot of times they personalized it. That's a cool one. I like the homemade ones. To me, that's folk art. Somebody took the time to make those. They tell stories about, you know, in the old days where you used to get a two by four and nail a, a roller skate. We actually did that. My first skateboard was a roller skate, cut in two. Because I remember as a very young kid, my father bought me a pair of these uh, strap-on skates that you could adjust. You'd slip them on over your shoe and that. The, the funny thing was, when people talk about that, it was true, it did actually happen, so. That's my interest started, how fast I could go down a hill. It was looked at as a really, a really dangerous thing. And especially with the, with the horrible equipment, I think it really was. And I think a lot of people got hurt. And so it didn't take that long for parents to not really be into it. And they would take the boards and like throw them in the basement or hide them from the kids. Or they, they didn't want, they didn't, last thing they wanted to have to do was go to the ambulance. Even though I was kind of small it, it, for my age and I was younger, I did like daredevil things. And I liked, you know, I liked jumping off the high dive and I liked doing all that kind of stuff. So when I saw a skateboard, I was like, yes. There's a way to fly and do acrobatic, you know, do acrobatic things and aerials, and um, and I, I was drawn to it immediately. Partly, I got that tag because in the beginning the gear wasn't very skatable. It was fun to do, no matter if it was skatable, but it just wasn't very skatable. So you could lose interest quick, and kids were getting hurt. So I just think it eventually, thank God. It evolved into something that was a lot safer and funner. They invented the urethane wheel, like this is hard to see, but this is an old urethane wheel, and it was rubber. And it, it, it opened up the whole world because they, they said like rocks and cracks and stuff in the road is what was the main cause of people getting hurt. And that made it a lot easier to absorb the bumps and go over the cracks and handle the rocks. And yeah, I think I think that was a huge turn. And once that happened, then they started the boards got more skatable, they started getting wider, the grip tape got better, the bearings got better, the truck, everything got better. So as the boards got better, so did the, the riders. Skating is, is exhilarating. Um, it's, uh, it's very creative, it's very, uh, you, you know, it's very spontaneous. Um, it can give you a sense of self-confidence that perhaps you haven't found elsewhere because it's all about your own motivation and your own challenges and overcoming those. Um, and it's constantly evolving. I mean, I, I, the thing I love about skating is that there is always something new to learn. You cannot, you can't do everything. There's, there's always some new, new level to reach or some new technique and, or something to improve on. Um, I started skating uh, because my older brother was was doing it a little bit. He was a surfer and he would skate when the waves are flat. Skateboarding was just sort of coming into the main, I don't want to say mainstream, but you know, it was just starting to happen. And then I noticed that some of my friends were skating around the neighborhood and, and I, I started using my brother's old board to join them. Um, and I didn't really, it wasn't like a it wasn't an epiphany or anything that I had when I started skating. I just liked it. I liked, I liked the, the motion and the freedom of it. I would have initially got into it through, there was a guy on my road who would have gotten aboard probably around 1987 or 1988 when it got really big. Like when, I think it was really small up till then and then it went through a phase where it seemed like everyone got really into it and there was loads of guys who used to have jump ramps in, and used to bring them down to, it was a Quinsworth um, car park down in Blanchardstown. So there used to be guys down there and I, that was where I first ever witnessed a skateboarder, like in real life. But up until then it would have been 
Back to the Future. It was around that time that some of my friends were influenced by Back to the Future and I think that's why they probably spent three or four months trying to learn how to jump over a two by four on a proper board. I had a paper round out in Swords and uh, I wanted to get a skateboard. So I fucking made one like every other kid did, you know, because you couldn't buy them. And I went down, doing my paper round around Swords Village on it and I went into the dentist that I used to sell a newspaper to every day. And she one day just called me in and she says, I had this in the garage and she gave me this fiberglass board. I had a cousin who, guy, John Rogers, guy from Mayo, um, came up to our house a few weeks in the summer as the, the Culture cousins come up. And for some reason, just when he got there, our local post office got the polyprop plastic skateboards in. So John had a few bobs, we bought two skateboards and straight down to Bushy Park and spent however long it took to actually get from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill and that was me starting skating and that was it. Now it didn't, it didn't continue all the way because it just it did officially kind of die, the fad was gone. There was nowhere to skate obviously was the key thing so kind of got into doing other things, messing around on bikes and whatnot. Probably about a year after I started skating I went to the skate park and, and saw, I saw people flying out of swimming pools and um, that was the moment for me. That was when I, I knew I was going to do everything I could to figure out how to do that how to fly. Always just had a board kind of lying around, but then I got into like BMX bikes and all that kind of thing. I went off to New York and I couldn't bring my bikes, had my skateboard. Saw guys skating Madison Square Gardens and stuff and like all enough onto walls about that high. Like that's 1985 or something like that. And I was like, right, fuck the bike and away I go, you know. <laughs> uh, I really started skateboarding when I was quite young, probably say seven or eight, just on plastic 70s boards, what were called polyprops, polypropylene boards. Um, I, one of my first bikes was a real American, kind of Schwinn Stingray type bike, long, long saddle, big V-bars. And I used to swap it with a friend of mine for goes of his skateboard, and we'd just go around the estate jumping off curbs and stuff. Uh, first board was literally a little bit bigger than a two by four and with a roller skate hacksawed in two. Uh, I spotted this roller skate in my neighbour's back garden. There were some girls living beside me and it was just getting rusted. So I decided to jump the wall one day and hit a hacksaw to it and just nailed it to the front of the board, the back of the board, and just started bombing hills near my house. Christmas 1985, I got my own board. So that was a um, toy shop purchase. Now, we had no idea that there was any difference between a board purchased from a toy shop and a board purchased from a skate shop. Paddy Kelly had a sports shop in Swords and he got in these big fat new looking skateboards. They were the business so I bought one, started skating, then eventually found out about Clive up in Hill Street. Popped in there and realised what I was skating was shite and I got a very flex board off of Clive and I'd been pretty much spent every single day at his place up at his shop skating his ramps and that's where it all kind of started you know. My brother Clive has ha had a bicycle shop in Hill Street and um, I, um, I used to, he, he, he used to sell BMXs and stuff like that. So we used to race BMXs. Started back in 1978 up in Hill Street and um, at the time I was doing a bit of BMX stuff. I was probably one of the only shops you could actually buy anything decent if you were into BMX. And skateboarding had been around prior to that but it had become forgotten about and this was sort of, it was starting to reappear in some of the magazines, mostly BMX magazines, you see the odd picture of a skateboard, but skateboards since we had last seen them had changed. There was a magazine at the time called Rad and that was, it was a mag coming out of London and you could get that in, um, you could get that in Easton's, but like I remember the first issue I got it at had, um, in the, there was like a part in the magazine would have like a, a kind of mail order thing. So this is before the internet or before. So there'd be all these pages where it would list like all the new boards that they had and all the runners they had and wheels and stuff. And Clive said a tiny little ad in that. And I remember like cutting the ad out and sellotaping that to the bottom of my board just because like I couldn't afford any skate stickers. And I remember thinking like, oh, this makes me part of the gang. Like I've got a Clive sticker. So one of the lads got a board and another one of us got a board. So then I'd say from the kind of mid 80s onwards was, was skating proper. And that was kind of where Clive's came in and all that. In Dublin, like it was very much, a min like it was a minority thing. It was definitely a subculture. And I think if you saw someone in town who had like 
Ollie Marks on the side of their shoes or who was wearing like a Santa Cruz t-shirt or something, you would kind of give them a nod or, or just chat to them. Back then, sure, you might as well have been a leper. I mean, the looks you got and people would go out of your way to have a go at you, you know, either physically or verbally, like you'd see them after and say, what are you doing skateboarding? You know, that's for kids. Or, you know, even I remember skating through town with Jono and Pete and all the crew and, and guys be coming trying to, you know, give you the elbow on the path or getting out, you know, going out in the road or trying to literally knock you off your board. It's just like being an alien or something in Dublin, you know? Like you'd skate down the street and everybody'd be like, oh, bloody skateboarders. Then the security guards come out and hassle us. It was always security guards after a certain amount of time. Oh, not even on Good Friday. It doesn't matter. No, just... Don't push my foot. Just put it away. Don't push my foot. That's it, OK? Oh. OK, literally one minute and we're out of here. Guards are here in two minutes. In the 80s and in the early 90s, it was kind of looked down on, but it was just it was a core group of lads that were hitting it up. And once a lot of the cops would come chase you out, but they, they didn't, they told you to leave. It wasn't like they are going to haul you in or whatever, you know, unless you maybe you're damaging something. But we were just skating. That's the thing about skateboarding, you're just having a good time. And isn't that, what you, isn't that what you're supposed to do when you're a kid? You know, like, that's what you do when you're a kid, is have a blast. And that's what it is, it's a blast. Kind of draws a different kind of head, like, you know, most of the lads weren't really into team sports or whatever, and you know, just are kind of more attracted to things like skating, biking, blading, whatever, you know? So, I don't know, I guess just they're the sort of people I like hanging out with, you know? Just doing something a little bit different from the norm, like. I think they were just afraid of seeing something different, you know? It's like, you know, any people like, like, people like to be safe in their heads, and they see something new, they're like, oh, I don't know, get rid of him, you know? <laughs> I don't know, this is weird. Young lads are into football. Not everybody's into football. And generally you find people who, like skateboarding, hate football. I think a lot of, there's a lot of a similar sort of a, a trait, if you like, in skating. In that, from my experience, most of the people who are into it aren't really the team sports type of people. And like, I went to a Christian Brothers school. It was gah, it was hurling. It just didn't really hold any appeal for me. So where, where you know, other lads would be off training and playing matches and that, it was, it was something to do, simple as that. And as soon as, you know, there was a place where people could at least meet, you know, which was Clive's, and then from there go off on a mission wherever you got to. But as soon as there was some sort of a central place, that meant it was something kind of permanent rather than just this transitory, temporary thing. When I started skating, um, I did it at a time when it, it was deemed really uncool. Um, it was it, like it'd come and gone. And so basically, since I was still skating, it was like, you still playing with that thing? Are you serious? You know, to be like, you still do yo-yos? And so um, I, I didn't care so much what my schoolmates thought, to be honest, because I, I already knew that I loved it so much I didn't, that it wasn't gonna affect me. And, and like, I was, I played baseball and I played basketball and I did okay, but it wasn't something that I kept improving at. The reason I got into skateboarding was when I was really young, and I think first or second grade, we had show and tell, like on Friday at school, and uh, my mom had bought me this little roller derby skateboard, a little Mustang, and uh, I took it with me to show and tell, and um, the teacher was bummed. Like it, she, it, it like caused sort of a disturbance in the class. Everyone wanted to try it, and the teacher was all scared, and um, she told me never bring it back again, don't ever bring it back in, and ever since then, I just sort of stuck, you know? Maybe that was what was cool about it. I, when I saw everybody else really wish that they would have brought that to Boston, uh, show and tell, and maybe something spoke to me, You're like, wow, this is pretty cool, you know? And that's how it started for me. And then I, I've gone on and off, you know? Um, once I got my driver's license, I stopped skating, you know, for a little while. And get, it always happens girls in cars, and then I got back into it after college. So. And when I got, when I went skating, every time I went skating, I learned something new, even if it was just some minor technique. And I found this community of, of people at the skate park that, that were very like-minded, but also had the same attitude, like, fuck those guys, who cares what they think? We love this. And I really enjoyed that, you know? And, and I love that we had this, we had this community, we're sharing ideas, we're trying to figure out how to do new things together. You know, skating was so experimental then. It, 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 anything went. <laughs> Whatever you could figure out that was new, it was like, oh, there's a new thing. You get to name it. You get, you know, maybe, maybe someone took a picture of it. I think skating is hugely creative, and I mean, it, it, it is very much an art form. I think it's a real sort of physical art, you know, when you look at some of the pictures of 
Osoi or Hawk coming out of the ramps like and you see them and you're like, it's like, it's like a work of art, you know? It's like sculpture for a minute and then it's gone. You know, in our day, the only way you could judge anyone's prowess was through competition. So that became the sporting aspect of it. And so the, sometimes those worlds clash, you know, where people say, it's not a sport. Well, well, we compete in it, it's active. So yeah, it's a sport. You could get like a, a rule book this is the rule book, and this is just a supplement. It says, interim rule book. Official rule book will be published in 66. And this just tells you, this is the rules right here. This entire content of the rule book remains the property of the National Skateboard Championships. And I've got no portion of this rule may be reproduced without written permission. Now, they're, they're done. These are discount coupons. But here's Flatland Slalom. These are the different types of competitions. Downhill Slalom. It tells you how to set up the course. It talks about how, two seconds from the first marker knocks over. All the rules, trick riding, kick turn race, total point scoring, hints. So this is just sort of what was going on in 65, which was the year I was born. But so skateboarding, when I, my parents weren't into it when I was born. I think they were in, into school. Clive was always well into the BMX thing. And for me, it was the bike shop first and gradually it started getting skateboards in. So I would have been aware of Hill Street from very, uh, probably from when I was 11 or 12, maybe. There's a thing in my family where basically we, we there's seven boys in my family, and we always loved things with wheels on them, actually. And that kind of came from my granddad who was into motorbikes, and then my dad was into motorbikes, and our whole family would be, well, out of the seven brothers, I think six of us would be into bikes. A few of us have raced bikes and stuff like that. So we were always into, as kids growing up, we were always into making things with wheels, go-karts, scooters, whatever, you know. And because my dad sold bicycles, um, we would have had lots to work with, you know, lots of bits and pieces. So I would say that's where Clive's thing with, with skateboarding came. Well, they kind of went hand in hand, you know. I mean, anyone who is into BMX riding, you know, has a certain attitude. There's a bit of risk in the sport. It's an individual sport as well. You can put your own mark on what you do. Skateboarding is the very same. And I suppose it was just a natural progression. The BMX magazine that started showing one or two pictures started showing towards the end, it was one or two pictures of BMX bikes and the rest of the magazine became skateboarding. So you could see the pickup, the interest in it. Skating was coming up, like, yeah, you'd, a bike shop would carry a few boards naturally and so on, because it kind of, it all fits, you know what I mean? And then ultimately skating really took off, so the bikes went out the back door, and the boards came straight in the front, you know? I'd always had an interest in skateboarding, so it was sort of a natural progression to keep the skate shop going, and I enjoyed myself. I love coming into work on a Monday morning. Well, definitely the, the skate shops in the, in the urban areas are the, are the places where everyone congregates, and that's where all the new, all the new ideas and all the new videos and, and everything in the news is, is shared. Um, and so I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's hugely important. I mean, obviously it, it's hard to keep a, a brick and mortar place going these days with the advent of the internet and everything accessible elsewhere, but, um, but it's definitely a great place to collect ideas. And usually the skate shops are the ones that, that are growing the scene. We'd all, like, we watch the videos up in Clive, we'd sit there for an hour or two, and then we'd all go out and try and recreate it ourselves which didn't really happen too well, but we tried, you know. <laughs> well, usually the skate shops are the ones that are, that are holding the events, that are sponsoring the events, that are, that are getting, you know, that are putting talented skaters on people's radar outside of their area. And so I think they're hugely important. This lad on my road, I can't remember his name, but he had, um, he was the first person I met who had a pro board. So I remember kind of um, around that time asking him where he got it. And that's when he mentioned about Clive's and the skate shop down on Hill Street. But I mean, I can clearly remember as I got closer to Clive's, I could hear this, um, you know, very distinctive clack of skateboards. And, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. I just knew that there was a, a skate shop there. I kind of turned the corner at the top of Hill Street to see this, you know, fairly substantial shop covered in graffiti and dozens of skateboarders just rolling around out the front of the shop.
I felt at home, felt freaked out first of all, because there was lads there who kind of knew what they were talking about, and I'd only ever seen stuff in magazines, you know. Um, and Clive being Clive with the smoke hanging out of the gob and his his ways. Um, but yeah, that I mean that didn't last too long. Second or third time in there, and you you felt like it was it was home. Y'all have a nice day now, you hear? And y'all come back again real soon. It was an amazing scene to get into when it really started kicking off, when everyone used to meet up there and they started putting ramps out the front. It was just, it was like a biker gang or something. <laughs> Size-wise and by today's standards, it was it was a small place, you know? Um, but it was it was small, but when you're a kid and you walk in and all you see is just wall-to-wall -wall skateboards, it's like it's Aladdin's cave, you know, it just seems huge. Going into the shop then, I mean, that was a, an experience in itself because there was, you know, the vaguely intimidating factor of actually getting to the place and then to kind of walk into this shop that just seemed to be, you know, full of crazy people. And the shop was kind of a focal point because it was the only shop that stopped anything like that. I think the first time I went in there, like it wasn't actually, I'd heard about Clive's for years and years, but obviously I was only like an eight or nine year old kid, so I couldn't really um, be jumping on a bus in the town. But I used to just hear about it through the older lads in our, like our area that skated. And then I think one of the first times I went in there was with my confirmation money. I mean, I had no idea who was working there. I had no idea what I was meant to ask for. Um, I had my kind of... I was really aware of my cheap supermarket skateboard under my arm. It became fairly obvious who was working there when um, Clive came out of the back room and there's this fairly big guy, leather jacket, he kind of walks out, starts cursing at everyone and yelling at everyone to get the hell out of the shop, go out and skate, clear the place so he can do a bit of work. Clive's the man really, you know what I mean? He's like, uh, I know he's kind of like a surrogate dad to a lot of the fucking dysfunctional feckers that were around at the time, you know? It wasn't like it was a certain group of skateboarders in the country who went there. Every skateboarder in the country went there because that was the only real shop. Everyone just went there. And I think it was cool. It seemed to be like there was definitely a good sense of community there. And um, it was just really exciting. Like the place was, as I'm sure people have said, like it was, it was a rough spot. And I remember like going there. The first few times I went there on my own, just getting lost and ending up getting chased out of the flats and just You'd constantly have people running into the shop who would have been chased in by heads outside trying to start in them. And yeah, I was slap bang in the middle between two blocks of flats. There was Hill Street on one side and Hardwick Street on the other. Um, and it would have been a hard neighbourhood. I mean, back then it was pretty basic. We didn't have much money, any of us, you know. Pretty rough, a lot of rough heads, you know, around Hill Street from the flats. And pretty much most days you get hassle. I remember one guy, the guy, <clears throat> Cross with Clive, he was, thought he was American, he had all the V8s, Hayden, you know, he looked like Clint Eastwood or something, or at least he, he thought he was. He used to have all the V8 cars, were pretty cool, after Clive, so we'd be watching him every day and he'd go up and down the horse. And, but he'd always, he particularly didn't like me or Jono, so he was always having a go at me and I just, I just used to stand there laughing at him and Jono would be laughing at him. And, you know, he'd come up and give shapes, but he never hit us, you know. But I think after a while he grew to like us. Same with the guys in the flats, they, you know. But it was a hard, Dublin was very hard then. There was, was, you know, it wasn't, there was no flash cars or money around like there is now, you know. It's part of an older part of Dublin. And uh, yeah, it was mostly just all the local kids from the flats would always give the skaters hassle. And I had horror stories like, ah, you're going to Ireland, you know, and Irish are going to smash you in and like, what have you. And, and I had things of Hill Street and what have you, where like kids had been robbed and what have you. And, I, you know, I was just a young nipper at the time as well, so I was like, ooh, is it going to be all right or is it going to be sketchy, you know? Bleak, yeah, bleak for sure. And even the set in the Clive's where it was, like, you know, Hill Street up, off the back of the garden remembrance or up kind of Belvedere direction, it was just, it was a kip, it really was. And I remember even the first couple of times, like, I used to cycle in, and it is the old thing, if you'd be coming around the corner, you'd be pulling your socks up kind of thing, you know, and just head down and don't make eye contact. So, um... It was, a, it was a rough gaff, there's no two ways about it. Hill Street probably wasn't the best of all areas for skateboarders to 
be skating in, you you know, you'd arrive with a new board and then you might get your new board robbed from a few of the locals, look, and that was always a bit of a task, getting up to Hill Street, especially if you're a small kid, look. I was probably 11, so wandering up to Hill Street when you're 11 years old with 100 pounds in your pocket trying to get a new board and hope to God you didn't get robbed, look. It's not a street you'd go up to with your wallet in your pocket. If you had money, you'd try and maybe put it in your sock. <laughs> you'd, uh, we, we'd had lots of run-ins with the locals and they, there was always, like for maybe a month it might be cool and then something to kick it off, some argument or something, but you know, we've had bricks thrown at us and them running after us with iron bars and mad face-offs with <laughs> extremely aggressive yo locals. So, uh, yeah, there was, <laughs> it wasn't the, the friendliest part of the city to be skating in. Uh, it was a bit mad, all right. You didn't need a helmet for falling off your board. You needed a helmet to dodge the coal being thrown at you, you know? It was, <laughs> it was lethal up at Hill Street. I can remember one day Clive having to do, I don't know, maybe half a dozen runs up to Temple Street Hospital. Kids getting injured with just gangs from around the corner throwing rocks and you name it at us, like, you know? We were complete weirdos as far as North Inner City Dublin people taught, saw us, you know what I mean? Some of the kids used to have to come up Hill Street or Parnell Square and come down Denmark Street to try and find the shop, so um, occasionally they were came running in through the door, <laughs> being chased by a local mob, but people got used to that. You know, John, I used to work in the shop, look, so uh, he was probably one of the best skateboarders in Ireland at that stage, so everybody knew John O, look, and same with Pete Rohn, Clive's brother, and then a few of the other heads that I was so young at that time that you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't be allowed to hang around with the, the older guys, look, you're just another little kid, look. John O used to work for me years and years ago. He was only, he was a young kid at the time, you know? And uh, he was from the south side, but he used to get a bit of stick from the locals, and he got a bit of a name for himself. But um, you were trying to serve a customer, and the kids were throwing cans in, and fucking all this sort of one, or going down the end of the street one of the days. Um, I basically grabbed one of the kids and threw him out the door. Next thing you know, there's about 30, 40 lads with iron bars, like, oh, fucking 14 year olds or whatever, you know, coming chasing all the skaters. And there was more of us, with all the skaters fucked off down the road, and there's like me and two of my friends still here, like, defending ourselves with skateboards, you know? But uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty mad. Like. He took off, and I said to Jono, you better go home early, because this could, this could be trouble. So Jono took off for the rest of the afternoon, and about 20 minutes later, Two men in their, I would say, 50s walked into the shop. One had a hammer in his hand, and the other guy had a crowbar. And they had a, another kid in tow with them, and they were saying, is that him pointing at me? Unfortunately, the kid said, no, no, it was only a young lad, I don't see him. And they inquired after Jono, and I said, I'd never seen him before. So that, that's sort of a memory that sticks where I was almost killed. <laughs> Check out my feet, then go to my board, then go to here. Okay, so. no, I can tell you it's going to be very different. Hi, can I help you? Jono was like, um, he was like a sort of 16 year old version of Mike Tyson, you know? Jono was good at dealing with the security guards. <laughs> oh no. Get out of here, please. What? Get out of here. You've got to call the crash sergeant. How the fuck can I? It was him. I'm reporting to the guards now. Okay? Get your facts right and get back your fucking car. Jesus. You get out of this area. No. Okay, what gives fine. you the right to tell me? I'm because I'm a, I pay taxes. So do I, so what? Just get out of here. You caused an accident here. There's a second thing going across the road. Now, if you don't want. The police uh, will get you, okay? I heard stories about Clive keeping a big um, bat under the counter. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but like that kind of nearly added to the, to the mystery of it. And that was part of it as well. Like, so. And I'd heard stories about him with his baseball bat and like stuff. So I was like, well, I wonder if this bloke's gonna be like super gnarly, but he was like the friendliest down to earth bloke ever, you know? So I know he certainly used to keep a, uh, like a, a wooden, you know, nightstick for beating up the locals, but he used to have, <laughs> he used to have a harpoon gun on a nail. And I used to ask him and say, what? like, because as a kid, I'd be kind of going, what are you going to do with that, you know? And he says, uh, I said, would you 
shoot someone if someone came in and tried to hold up the shop, you know? And he says, no, I wouldn't. I'd let them get over the counter because he, he kept the tail in a room in the back, you know? <clears throat> so he'd say, um, he said like, no, 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 I'd let them get in and empty the till, you know? He says, what I do is just as they're climbing back over the counter is I just unhook that and I'd shoot them up the arse with it. <laughs> I think he wasn't messing either. He would have, wouldn't he? But the locals, when I moved in there first, uh, used to try and take advantage, but they got to know me and I got to know them, so I didn't get a whole lot of trouble from them. What I thought when I was going there was I was thinking it was going to be even more underground and even more sketchy, and, and the actual real vibe was when I got there, we got to the, you know, Clive's shop or whatever, and loads of kids, like, you know, all wanting to hang out and skate, and, uh, and it was totally warm and welcoming. Kind of like the first time I came to California, I was like, oh, am I going to get shot going to the shops, you know? It's not like that, is it? You know, you experience it and then you go, all right, there's sound people here, there's sound people there, there's sound people everywhere. It's just, just who you choose to hang out with, you know? Because I like skateboarding myself, I, um, I thought it was great to see other people. Because there would have been very few skateboarders in the old days, in the early days. So as more kids started getting into it and that. And not just kids, I mean older guys as well, but as they started kind of getting into it, it, it started to grow. When we started off, we used to go to building sites, pinch timber whenever we could get, whatever we could get our hands on, go down to some, what, what looked like abandoned piece of land and build a half pipe or, or so on, you know? Anything you wanted to skate was DIY because, I mean, it just didn't exist, so. Uh, I mean, I built so many ramps. There was kind of an outlaw feel in the way up at Clive's because the cops would always be calling around and tell them to get the ramps in off the road or they'd be telling them to, you know, ask the kids to stop skateboarding on the central bank or whatever. Clive used to put some ramps and grind bars and things like that in front of the shop. Now, Hill Street, it's quite a wide street, but I mean, he didn't have a a recessed shop or a patio or anything like that. This was ramps just literally stuck out onto the street. We used to see pictures in magazines and videos and that, and all the Americans had skate parks and ramps, and nobody here had anything really, so I started putting ramps together. Um, I used to make them so I could fit them in the shop at night, and when I'd open in the morning, I'd take them out and assemble them. I'd have to get in early to make sure I got at least three parking spots in a row right outside the shop because that's what it took for some of these ramps to be set up. Um, I used to occasionally get a bit of trouble from the police saying you can't put ramps on the street and I'd assure them I was going to take the ramps in as soon as they were gone, which never happened. So the ramps stayed uh, there for quite a number of years. Clive used to have two little mini ramps beside the shop, so that was kind of a plus for going to Hill Street, is at least then you'd get, get a little skate in the ramps as well. There wasn't many ramps back in the day, look, so it was something new and it was something different to skate. I remember those ramps beside the shop and you used to have to go in to, to Clive's and I think pay like 50p or something so you could go in and skate the ramp and they'd have, they had these little stickers, like a fluorescent sticker that they'd put on your truck and then when you went around, you'd come out of the shop and go around to the shed kind of where the ramps were and um, I think you'd have to show someone that you had the sticker and then they'd let you in to skate. Next door to the shop there was a, a little old man who used to make furniture and he had a premises which was basically just tin roof, one story. Um, he was there for a good few years, but when he moved out, I think he eventually died and his son took it for a while, but cleared this big, big shed out. And I inquired as to who was renting it and I ended up taking this place as well and putting in mini ramps. And these would have been, you know, nobody, most of the kids would never even seen a mini ramp apart from in a picture. It, once Dan Clive put the ramp in next door, then there was a real reason to come there. And like I'd, you'd regularly see lads coming in the school uniforms and the bag would go behind Clive's counter and in they'd go and they'd be at school, you know. Sometimes they would, you know, take a day off school and uh, leave the school bag in the shop and disappear in next door for a couple of hours just skating on the mini ramp till around about four o'clock when they were due home with their school bag and off they went. It was like a tiny little barn type building right next to the shop, you know, and the ceiling was probably eight feet tall, like your normal house. So we built these miniature little half pipes like the one we have here for the kids. We built two of them and we used to just go down and session all day. It was packed, you know, and 
it was the only indoor place. And apart from Clive's own backyard ramp, it was the only place that skaters could actually go and skate without getting busted by a security guard or something. At one stage, I thought it was time to maybe do something on a slightly bigger scale than just have ramps outside the shop. So there's a place in Dunleary, uh, it was the Top Hat Ballroom. In fact, I think it was Wally Wabbits then after that. But the Top Hat Ballroom had a lovely maple wooden floor and a balcony viewing area and all that. And it was only used on a Thursday night for bingo, which was a terrible shame. And I found the guy who owned it lived not too far away. And I asked him would it be possible to maybe take it at the weekends and put in skateboard ramps. And I said that, he said, well, it has a maple floor. And I said, absolutely perfect, because I mean, that'd be a nice surface for skateboarding on. So he gave me the go ahead on that. And I ended up making a bunch of ramps. Uh, basically, we nailed them to the maple floor every Sunday, <laughs> which was, uh, but it wasn't being used for anything else. So nobody really minded. And for quite some time, I think maybe twice a month, uh, the top hat was open for skateboarding. Everybody paid, I think it was a pound at the time to come in and skate. And all those pounds went towards building new ramps. So it started getting a bit bigger and a bit bigger. Just kind of developed naturally. What else could you do, you know? Um, apart from Clive's, like Clive would put on, um, you know, all the top hat competitions. Like anything that was done was basically done by Clive. You know, like the point depot competition and the top hats, the Powell demonstrations and all that kind of thing. Like Clive's responsible for all that, like. Okay, Peter, anything? Do you hear that now? There's no skating around upstairs. No skating in the back area. So, uh... In 1990, um, the Bones Brigade came over. They were used to touring Europe and England, and I don't think Tony Hawk had ever heard of Ireland before. I wouldn't have thought he knew where it was on the map. In the 80s, the Bones Brigade was, was the sort of preeminent, or the premier of skate team, um, consisting of you know guys like Steve Caballero and Lance Mountain, Mike McGill, Rodney Mullen, Tommy Guerrero, and myself, and then a whole slew of, of amateurs and other pros that came in um, not long after that were all very iconic in their own way. And so um, a lot of people were looking to us in terms of innovation and um, for touring, you know, we were the go-to team for the most part. I mean, obviously there are other teams, Santa Cruz Vision, and, and they all had some, some super good riders as well, but, but I think collectively ours was considered the best. I made contact with a few people in England who I knew and said, look, you know, it'd be great if these guys could come over. And they said, well, if you look after them for the weekend, we'll send them over. So I agreed to that and Tony Hawk and a few others came over. Um, we put on a big demo in the, the top hat. And I suppose you could say to me, it'd be like getting Muhammad Ali over here to box, you know? Like Tony Hawk is that kind of, you know, stature. He's, I think Tony Hawk made skateboarding huge and acceptable because he's such a good role model. He had all the computer games. He made it acceptable for kids to skate now. So yeah, it'd be like Muhammad Ali coming to a small boxing club in Dublin. That's what it'd be like. Well, I remember, uh, I remember our European tour vividly because we, I mean, that was the longest I'd ever been overseas. I think we were gone for almost six weeks. And so we were going all over Europe and then they said, yeah, we want you to, want you to go to Ireland as well. And we took a ferry, um, which seemed like forever to me, you know, as a kid, like not really being that much of a world traveler, understanding the layout of, of you know, any of that area. Yeah, the whole thing, skating with Tony Hawk at the time, that was brilliant. Who was there? It was Nicky Guerrero, Tony Hawk, Mike Manzuri, and Bucky Lassick, yeah. All still skating, it's rad, you know? It was great to skate, to go down there and skate at that, that event because you were skating with real idols, you know what I mean, at the time, so... That was cool that Clive had managed to organise that whole thing, you know? When we would walk around, especially when we were near you know, the area of the shop, people would, would be scrambling and recognizing us. Be, I mean, I guess it'd be the same thing today, but what would happen is everyone's on their cell phones and then immediately there'd be a crowd. <laughs> so I guess lucky for us or unfortunately for everyone else, they didn't really have that speed of information at the time. You know, I, obviously the, the Irish skaters were very passionate 
and you could tell that there was a vibe just in terms of non-skaters where things could get ugly because, you know, we looked different. I mean, anywhere we went at the time, it was obvious that we were not the same or we didn't really belong in the, in the mainstream scene. And so um, I remember feeling a little bit uneasy uh, walking around, but at the same time, when the skaters would encounter us, they were like out of their mind excited. Shortly before opening time, I decided I'd have a look out and see, was there anybody there waiting to get in? And as it ended up, there was a queue right down the road. And I think it was about seven, seven or eight hundred people. Now the top hat wasn't that big, so it was packed to capacity. I remember the crowd being super excited. Um, and for us, that was a pretty big crowd, but the, the fact that they were kind of so close and on top of us, and anything we did, they were stoked on, you know. And, and there's some there's some places, I don't even know, I, I can't make rhyme or reason of why certain places go off and some don't. But on that tour, we definitely did some demos that just fell flat. I mean, we skated well, but it was just like, yeah, all right, cool. And in Ireland, they were like, we walked in, and it was like, yeah, they're here. And, you know, you do a little ollie, it's like, ah! Um, and that's way more fun for us. I mean, you know, not, not that we need or that we're looking for tons of praise all the time, but it's way more fun when people are that excited. What up? Tony Hawk and the Bones Brigade, they put on a great show. The biggest ramp we had in there due to size of storage and that was a, a quarter pipe about five foot tall but he managed to pull a 540 on it which is absolutely amazing. About 15, 16, the nearest park to us was uh, in Northampton and we used to go over there with a friend and we'd get the ferry over and then spend four or five hours on the train, stay up all night and then arrive at the skate park on about eight o'clock in the morning and then we'd skate for the weekend and then go home and that was, that was our skate park look, like, even though it was in a different country. Look. I heard about Simon Skate Park, which is down in Sir John Rogerson Ski and that would have been like 92 to 93 even. I don't even know if it lasted that long. That was amazing. That was Simon and Paul McKean that opened that up. That lasted for about two years. Um, they managed to open that on the back of, there was a big squeeze event that was on down in the Point Depot, I think in 92. So I think skating looked trendy. It was on RTE. We had a big vert ramp set up for the weekend. And I think uh, there was a bit of grant aid coming into new businesses starting. Yeah, we had the Flip Guys, which was uh, Death box, I think, at the time, which are like world famous skateboarders. That was that was actually uh, that was a really cool demo, um, and I don't even know if it was like a demo really. It was like you know we were just skating with with the guys, you know what I mean? Like, um, which was rad about those days with, with the old death box days. It wasn't like a set thing, and there'd be someone on the microphone going, "Okay, and now this guy's dropping in or what have you." It'd be like it'd be like, all right. It, Nice to meet you. Let's go skating, and um, and that's good. And that's probably hard to do nowadays as well with all the skate knobbing and you know authorities and what have you. So like you know, in those times, you could you could go and do that. Unfortunately, it just closed down, you know. Ran into financial trouble or something, you know. The location wasn't great. A lot of the skaters got put off having to go to it because you had to fight your way down the Keys, you know, and you had, every, you had all sorts of scumbags from that part of town, like, just, they'd corner you, you know, there was nowhere to run. 
So a lot of kids stopped actually going and I think that kind of made life a little bit more difficult for Simon then with that park, so it closed. After that, the next park was my own. I opened a place called Pipeline 2 up in Upper Dominic Street. Um, it lasted a good six months, you know. Great investment. We had no planning permission or any of that. Not that we cared. We were closed down, we were ordered to close. So we did that. Went back to college to do a degree, thinking, you know, good for my future. Did a marketing degree. Finished up really well, got a nice 2-1 degree. Went back and built another skate park. That was, that was ramping rail. I did that with Wayne Gallagher. I have a fond memory of skating down the street in Ireland with all the Irish guys like you know like around and we and we were just blasting down the street and we were hitting up spots on the way to spots you know and and they were like no way this is cool and I was like yeah this is cool for me because I'm skating like new stuff that I've never seen you know what I mean or been to so like so yeah that was that was yeah an amazing time all different corners of Ireland, like we're coming down, spending the weekend going skating. Like you'd see 50, 60 skaters uh, at a time going down O'Connell Street and go down to Bagot Street, going to Central Bank, going to around all the different spots. Like, you know, starting at 10 o'clock, coming back at 6, and then I know, hang out for an hour, watch a video, and then go do it all again at night time. Like, you know. So. We, were like, we were like the muskers of our generation, you know what I mean? Like, like we would get pinned up and like, by loads of kids and be signing everything. And they'd be like, God, oh, I've got to try and practice. You know, like, you're not giving me much of a chance here. But they didn't care. They would be like, yeah, man. And that was our vibe too. We'd be like, yeah, when you appreciate what we do, we appreciate you appreciating, appreciating us. You know what I mean? So it was totally like that in Dublin. It's amazing. You can't not love the fact that someone's appreciating what you're doing. Because if you are, you're killing yourself right there, aren't you? You're like basically going, oh, well, you know, everywhere you go, it's kind of a family vibe. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, you know, I've always said, you know, it's probably possibly one of the only sports where you could go and, and you're guaranteed to kip on someone's sofa for free. Do you know what I mean? Like, because it's like a welcoming, a welcoming like, like thing like that. I think skating is one of those things that once you've got a skateboard, like you've got friends everywhere, like you can sleep on someone's couch. It's it's a passport look. But yeah, Clive's was um, absolutely like that. Do you know what I mean? But like, um, I guess for me, I'd never been to Ireland before, so I was like expecting it to be a bit rougher. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, um, but no, it was like everyone there was super welcoming. Clive was sound, you know what I mean? And we, and, and, and everyone, everyone loved us coming out, which was really flattering and nice. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, 
so obviously that was reciprocated or what have you. Um, like you know, we we loved it. We loved the vibe back. You know, that's, I mean that's what skating's like, isn't it? You know what I mean? So yeah. In the back of Central Bank, my dad was doing a delivery, and I remember again I saw somebody jump over one of the shores, and it turned out to be a few of the local lads that I hung around with for years. So uh, t Central Bank was like a huge influence on skateboarding back in the day as well. Yeah, yeah, Central Bank, kind of mid-80s, mid to sort of, I'd say 86, 87. We used to skate in there, and pretty much to, for, for a period of time, we were kind of left to our own devices. Um, and there'd only be a couple, like, say, Rod, Shaggy, myself, there'd be a couple of lads skating. Um, and it, the, the worst that would happen is the security guard would come out and say, oh, lads, you're making a bit of noise there, and we'd, we'd just go. And when it was a little small crew like that, it was no major drama. Nobody got too pissed off about it. But as skating definitely got more popular and then Central Bank became a hangout spot, it was just you could see the security guards going, I'm not having this, this is, this is bullshit. I think we were just cruising the streets. We were animal chinning it, you know what I mean? Just like blasting down the streets, big posse, like, you know, I'm sure the locals were like, what the hell's going on? Like, but. Um, that's the fun, the, the more funner vibe that, that I remember from that, like from being out there. We went to one spot where I'm not sure if it's the ledge over into the street gap, and then there was some other stuff in there, and we got busted pretty quickly. Like so, you know, and we got kicked out real quick, so we didn't really get to skate it too much. There's four minutes left, okay? Makes me four minutes, and we have to shoot it down. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, that is sick! Here, let me see that again. Let me see that again. Oh. 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 That is sick as fuck! Skating was getting busier and busier and busier as a sport, you know, so there were so many newcomers all the time. I remember we'd meet up and we'd almost be whispering to each other, we're going to skate, you know, the red bars. <laughs> So we had a name for every spot that we skated around town. Red Bars was called Red Bars because the bars that we skated were red. You know, very creative bunch of individuals there naming our spots. But um, we used to have to whisper to each other where we're going, we'd go around the corner and boot it down the hill so all the little, uh, the little kids wouldn't follow us because we used to get followed. It was like a train going through town, you know? Central Bank kind of got shut down. They started to put barriers up, so we started to look at other spots, and then Bagot became literally the home of skateboarding in Dublin for, I'd say, a good eight, nine years. because we had good spots to skate, smooth surfaces to skate, we were able to progress on a daily basis as well. Baggett Street, you could, you could make a film alone about the stuff that happened in Baggett Street, where it was, it was like the most amazing skate spot, like one of the most amazing European spots ever. Baggett Street is, has always been the hub of Irish skateboarding. Like even now, like people would always love to skate Baggett Street, but because it's skate stopped, it's kind of had that mystical theme to it like the place was just perfect it was like the whole plaza and all it was was just marble ledges and a few small steps and then this gap that went out over the the footpad onto the road bag of gap was at the front of uh main bank of ireland headquarters what was it a or b <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> shows how much attention we paid to actual building but there's a there's a long wall it's about yay high and it's uh we used to, it was a common spot just to, for trying to ollie onto it, grind along it, um, just do various tricks onto the wall. 
but um, the big thing to do was skate all along the wall to the point where it dropped down a flight of steps and then there was a footpath and then a road and you try and ollie off the top of the wall, clear the footpath onto the road. So you could do tricks from this block over the footpath onto the road. Perfect ground, whatever kind of stone the ledges are made from. They just, they just were perfect to skate. I mean, you could be down on Baggett Street some days and 50, geez, maybe even 100 people skating Baggett Street. Funny when the cops came, everyone scarpers every different direction. You know, on just one car. <laughs> and then every few months, the Bank of Ireland would pay for some lad with a sprayer thing to come along and spray all the wax off. And you'd, be, you'd get there and you'd just be like, oh, fuck, like, back to square one. So there'd be like three or four lads sat there just waxing the ledge, kind of moving down a bit. We're all down skating Baggett Street. The Mariah van pulls up anyway. We're not really doing anyone any harm, but they pull up anyway, in force. So we all scarpered every different direction. We hid in, a, in the back of a Georgian building under like a little bridge type thing. And next thing the guards come in, come out of the darkness. <laughs> they took our boards off of us and they, they told us that if we could make it to Harcourt Terrace Police Station before they did, we could have our boards back. Funny enough, we knew the city. We skated every laneway in the bloody place. And we got to the, the guard station before the, the car with all the boards got there. They never even took our names, they just handed the boards back. I think they saw the funny side of it too, you know? Yeah, that was the kind of, our Macba or Embarcadero or whatever back in the day, like, um, yeah, the bag of gap. I just want to say it was Simon McMahon that did it first. <laughs> just want to clear that up. Um, and uh, yeah, it, that was the main spot, that was, yeah, like you get down there and just skate all day and, um, you know, you get kicked out, you go around the corner to ESB, get kicked out of there, back around to Baggett Street again, like, and... I have heard that our Dublin was kind of at the foreground of skate stop and was doing it before any other large cities, that some of the companies behind making the actual skate stoppers were Irish-based. Now, I don't know if that's just conspiracy theories that I've heard, but... For as long as I've been skating it, there'd been rumours about, oh, you know, it's definitely going to be capped the next month, like, it's definitely going to go. And then, um, then we just turned up one day and it really was. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're only vandals. Here, take them. You're being televised already, so you needn't, you needn't worry about televising. Okay? In a way, it was probably a blessing in disguise because it, it meant people went and started exploring parts of the city that they, that they didn't before. People started going down to IFSC and they'd skate IFSC and then they'd go down to the skate park and uh, people would just find other spots. There was always like Leeson Street, uh, the Conrad Hotel was another place that people used to go to. There was always somewhere else but Baggett Street because it's such a big bank, it was such a nice place to, to skate with a lot of people. Or like I was saying before about how people kept saying like, oh, you know, Baggett Street's going to be capped, like that spot's going to be gone. And you heard it for so long that you just stopped believing it. Or you're just like, yeah, well, whatever, like it's, it's not going to happen. And then, to be honest, it was kind of the, the exact same in terms of the skate parks, where like for years you heard about, there was always petitions going around and people saying, yeah, there's going to be a park here. There's going to be a park in Monkstown. There's going to be, and there was always like rumours of like, oh, there's, a, there's definitely like, a public park happening and I just totally stopped believing it. I was just like, it's, it's not going to happen. The whole skate stopper thing 
there are kids. I mean, my my real passion for skating and the thing I'm, I'm probably most proud of is actually getting some skate parks built. And again, Roger Kavanagh and Michael Reedy, Shaggy, a few of us, like, we put the first petition in to Dublin City Council in 1986 and we got a skate park in 2004, I think it was. So basically 20 years of asking. It turned, but during that time, I was absolutely just resigned to the fact it was never going to happen, you know. And I can understand, you know, you're a business and you happen to have a ledge out the front of your place and there's kids coming and they're chipping it and scratching it and all you're thinking of is some kid is going to crack their head open and I'm going to get sued. So I totally understand it, but my argument to that would be those kids are going there mainly because there is nowhere else for them to go. So this is the thing, like you, you just see it with the skate parks and you see it like we're involved in Bushy and Lucan and the lads obviously down in Greystones as well. It, it just it pulls kids in, it gives them somewhere to go and it's a kind of it's that permanent thing that skating never really had before here. With everything, it's a love-hate relationship, but um, but yeah, it's, it's got to be good for skateboarding, isn't it? Because you know, the more you're, you're getting more people interested, even though that stops you skating street spots, like real street spots or whatever you. But then there's more skate parks being built, and that's obviously good for everyone in the long run. You know, there's a place for kids to go where they're not going to be doing stupid stuff, and then they can skate, enjoy themselves and you know make new friends and like and you know and it like again it's a, like the so like a social like good time like you know everyone feeds off everyone's energy and what have you and and everyone has like a rad time how can that be bad skateboarding it's like a video game that's never complete um every generation that's come to it has brought a completely new level to it um, it's like, as I said, when I first got into it, I was inspired by somebody learning how to ollie over a two by four, or somebody ollieing over a grate. The generation five years later then saw kick flips and flip tricks. The generation five years later is like, oh, maybe if we ollie and we could flip and we could jump that gap. So now at the moment, you've got some of the guys that we sponsor are doing flip tricks down 16 stairs. They're, it's just, it's, it's normal for them because they saw what was done by say the last generation. So it's gonna be insane to think what skating is gonna be like in another 10 years time. The high that I'm always going for is the moment that, you, that, that, the moment that I make something that I've never done before. Even if it's something that has already been done by someone else, it doesn't matter to me. It's the, the idea that I've gone a step further and I've, I've overcome something and I've, and I've made something possible that I only imagined. Um, and to this day, it's still like, that's still the big buzz for me. That's what I'm still chasing, even though, you know, I'm, I'm relatively old for, for doing it, but um, I still love tinkering with new stuff and, and trying new techniques and, and watching this whole sport evolve. I mean, it's amazing how far it's gone. Yeah, I'm Keith Walsh. I'm a skateboarder from Odevney Gardens. It's brought me everywhere. It's brought me to all over the place, like America, Europe, Started on the streets and then, through time, um, skate parks start getting built like all over the place. Um, Dublin City Council eventually started to listen to skateboarders that we've been telling them for like 25 years, you know, you should build skate parks. Like, what are they going to do if they don't like football and they don't like, you know, rugby or whatever else? Like, you know, you definitely need facilities. Like, 
and we had been at them for years and years and every time we approached them we were told it's a fad um, and they waited about 25 years and suddenly discovered it's not going to go away so they started putting in skate parks there's a fine example in Bushy Park and Taranur and Swords and Blanchardstown and we've probably got a total of about 35 skate parks in Ireland now which is great about time when Bushy Park was built like that that was the first kind of really kind of good, I don't know, public park that just, like it really worked. And I think the, the corporation could see, or like the council could see that, um, that it was getting used. It's just promoting skating. The more parks that open, people will keep skating. You know, a lot of people back in Clive's day would give up because, you know, they're getting sick of street skating, getting sick of kicked out of spots, there was no ramps. But now there's, there's skate parks everywhere that keeps all the skaters interested. All the parks are different, like you've got ramp parks, street parks, so there's a bit of everything for everybody. There's always like cops telling you to like get away from a certain spot or something, or it's like trespassing or something. But now you can just go to any skate park now and enjoy it, like, instead of getting like worrying about getting kicked out. But... No, without a doubt, Clyde's uh, was the, the focal point for all of that, like, starting point, yeah. God, <laughs> Daddy Clive, yeah. <laughs> all right, Clive. <laughs> well, most of us are still skating to this day, but I think it was the sort of cohesion we had as a group growing up and all the time skating that maybe kept us skating, you know, there was always someone to skate with. I still skate every week, like, I'd love to be able to skate every day, but I can't, like. If one thing I can put my hand up and say, I'm good at this, I can build decent parks. I think one of my earliest skateboarding memories is skateboarding on a plastic board when I was maybe seven or eight down the hill next to where the skate park is now. So it was kind of like a beautiful kind of circle of events coming back around. But for, for us guys from Dublin, I think that was, uh, if you were into skateboarding, that's where you went, like. I suppose in the old days, it was sort of, it was a very underground sort of a thing to be a skateboarder, whereas nowadays, because there's so much of it on 
like Eurosport and a lot of the cable channels and that. It, it's, it's accepted probably more now as a regular sport, especially with people like Tony Hawk, because I know he's very successful with PlayStation and Xbox 360 games. So a lot of kids would have got into skateboarding because they probably got an Xbox for Christmas and you know played the game first and then wondered if they could actually skate and sort of took it from there. Oh, I think any growth in skating is positive. I, I've never thought that somehow we had to covet it and, and hold it away from people. You know, I, I never could figure out as a, as a kid why more people didn't appreciate it. Um, and so that wasn't really my frame of mind. You know, what I mean, I didn't. I liked that it was different, but I didn't. I didn't necessarily like that it separated me from, you know, the, the kids I went to school with all of a sudden, um, or that I was marked to, to be doing something so strange. Um, and so when I see Skateboarding, as it, as it gets bigger and more appreciated by more, you know, nowadays parents encourage their kids to skate. That didn't happen when I was a kid at all. The exact opposite. And I think that's amazing because the people who have devoted their lives to it are finally able to make a living doing it. You know what I mean? Not that they're cashing in, it's just that they're finally validated for all their effort. And that's how I feel about it. And so, and so when I see these skate parks cropping up all over the place, I'm amazed at it. I, I love it. So we really had to work for what we wanted to do. Kids nowadays, they just need to pick up a board in the skate shop and then go to the park and then watch, watch some guy skating. And an awful lot of what you learn from, or how you learn to skate is through observation, watching other people skate. Partly the motivation and then you also see their techniques and so on. Whereas we had to watch uh, VHS tapes, which are probably two years old at the time, you know, and try and replicate what they're skating. You know, and if you like ramps, you have to build your own, and so on, I'm sure. I mean, we all grew up skating through another recession way back when, you know? Eh, uh, no, they're lucky little bastards, excuse the French. <laughs> it's way more, it, well, it's way more accepted in terms of um, mainstream recognition of being a career, a legitimate career. Um, you know, when I was, when I toured Ireland and we get on an airplane and people would be like, what do you do? I'm a professional skateboarder, they're just, they just laugh. Well, let's just hope there is a future in skating. <laughs> like, full stop, because if there's not, then that's, that's gonna be a lot of people disappointed. But um, I think, you know, I think as long as, you know, people keep doing it and progressing and what have you, and um, it's, it's gonna continue. People ain't just gonna stop, you know what I mean? Like, like people didn't stop in the, when the 70s, when it was big, you know, and then, yeah, it died out for a bit, but then it came back, right? And then, yeah, there's been a bit of a lull with the recession lately or whatever, but it's coming back again. Like, so, you know, it's the same with any, any kind of thing, isn't it? Like, you know, there's, there's times and waves of when things are really big and trendy and then when they're not, like, you know, and uh, it's probably just gonna carry on along that, along that vibe. But let's let's just hope it keeps you know with with all the now the new like you know media attention and the TV shows and what have you. Hopefully it just keeps like building it up and then the skate industry keeps like going strong, you know. And if not, it will just be underground again and we'll all be a bunch of knobheads skating down the street together. Wicked. Sounds all right to me. <laughs> I was just trying to worry about the the kids coming to skate and keeping the kids that are trying to decide if they're going to be a skateboarder or not, I just want to try and make them into a skateboarder, make them help their decision along instead of, you know, getting into football or instead of picking up that uh, Razor scooter, stick it with a board for a little bit longer, you know? It's so fun. Like, you really think we just, like, made all this up, you know, to try and take your money, you know? Like, it's because we're skaters, and that's what we like to do. It's fun. And I love that it's as much of an art form as it is a sport. I mean, it's, it's active and, and there's, it's competitive, but it's also very creative. And um, I've, I've met amazing people through skateboarding because it attracts people that, are, that are f think differently. I think he really loved what he was doing. And he, 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 you know, he was doing, he was living and working outside the normal parameters of life. And I think he loved, genuinely loved, you know, pushing the skateboard. And, uh, to new levels in Ireland and yeah, I'd say that's why, you know, it was exciting times. But I, I really think skateboarding had a place and by providing the facilities, I think now it's starting to take off and long may it last.
I hope it's still around when I'm dead and gone. What are up on your ears, yeah? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What the place in the garden? Don't fucking touch my camera, right? Don't fucking touch my camera. Don't fucking touch my camera. I fucking dare you to hit me. I dare you to hit me. I'll bury it up your hole, you fat racist fuck.